We're now moving into the last unit of the module on cultural assessment um, and working with Hispanics around issues of resilience and cultural competence and mental health. This last unit, we want to focus on a really exciting new development that comes out of the American Psychiatric Association in the latest iteration of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. All of you have at your disposal, either through your library or your personal copy, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Number 5 of the American Psychiatric Association. And one of the things that is being tried now, and is especially available to you for clinical trial and for research, uh, it's available online and the link is here with this particular unit, and we'll show that to you um, at, the end of the, at the end of the session. But it's, a, it's a, a unit called the Cultural Assessment and uh, Intervention Unit, and it's the, the module itself, or the technology itself, is called the Cultural Formation Formulation Interview. It's obvious now that the American Psychiatric Association, along with other psychiatric and psychological and counseling organizations, including the National Association of Social Workers, is increasingly aware of the importance of culture in doing good assessments and doing good interventions with clients from different sorts of ethnic and cultural backgrounds. And so we're just going to talk very briefly as we conclude this first module about the possible utility of, of this instrument for you in your practice and for you as students uh, who are going to be social workers who work in a clinical uh, or a mental health or medical setting. Um, first, though, we need to talk a little bit about some of the elements that the terms that are used widely in um, mental health around a culture uh, that maybe are still poorly defined in your own mind. And so I think the first one we have to talk about is the term cultural culture itself. Culture, in, in essence, is everything that's passed on from one generation to the next in the form of uh, technology and also, more importantly, for the case of mental health, ideas, beliefs, practices, customs, norms, habits, ways of thinking, and ways of understanding the world. So it's a system of knowledge, uh, values, and rules that, that have a powerful impact on, on a person and on a patient and on a client and how they formulate their own identity. This is very critically important in therapy because the formation of identity is such a key element in how one understands the world and how one, one becomes well. Another key concept, one which has been seriously abused since its invention, is the concept of race. This term really doesn't have much of a scientific basis to it. Um, we do see aggregations of, of physical uh, attributes uh, that differ by people according to their geographic and, 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 and continental origin throughout time, but those things have no significance in and of themselves because there's only one race, and that's the human race, and certainly that's the opinion of, of practice uh, professionals in anthropology, social, sociology, and also practitioners in social work. So we see race not so much as the superficial uh, physical attributes, but actually as a social construct one that has been historically used in a very negative way to adversely, uh, ha adversely affect the lives of people, especially people that we might see in, in practice. Uh, because we have to understand that race is a factor that figures into the oppression of people and that if we're going to deal with the construct of race, we're going to have to deal with it generally as a negative. On the other hand, the term ethnicity um, which, which is a very different sort of a term, refers to not just culture broadly, but within cultures broadly, the characteristics that people have around their belief system, their history, their geography, their language, their religion, and other shared characteristics of a group. This in contrast to race, which is a pejorative term, uh, which carries with it a, a notion that it's a burden, that people have deficits that are associated with them as a result of their race, which is very pejorative. Ethnicity is seen as affirming, and in that sense, culture is an empowering element. I come from a place, I come from a language, I come from a faith, or I come from a shared system of beliefs that don't identify me based on my physical characteristics so much, but about my nationality, my people, my culture, and in that sense, it's, it's an affirming element. And so we have to make really clear that the term Hispanic, the term Latino, is not a racial term. 
in the United States, the term Hispanic or Latino is referring to nationality or ethnicity. And when you identify yourself on an identity card, you fill out a form for the federal government, it will say white, African American, Asian, other American Indian, etc. These are broadly speaking so-called racial characteristics, but ethnicity is not. That's because ethnicity is a cultural determinant. Um, culture is seen uh, in this module and throughout the program uh, on cultural competence and resilience as an asset, as a strength. Too often we have seen culture used as a deficits model. The culture of poverty, for instance, where we say people remain in poverty because poverty is a form of learned helplessness. It's a form of deficit. We like social workers to turn that entirely on, on its head and begin to identify culture as a strength. Indeed, it's the psychological, interpersonal, and intergenerational issues, both negative and positive, that people bring to the world as a result of their cultural identity. And if you're going to argue that culture is a strength, then you're going to need to measure it as such. And the cultural formulation interview, which the American Psychiatric Association has devised, is a way of getting at it as a strength. We're going to go through each of these items in a little bit of detail, but we're going to talk about cultural identity, cultural conceptualizations of distress or adversity, psychosocial stressors, as well as resilience, since that's the theme of this module, cultural features of the relationship between the individual and the clinician, and throughout this module we've talked about the need for the clinician to be culturally competent, and then we're going to go into the cultural formulation interview, which essentially is how we can get at an overall cultural assessment of the patient or client. First then, let's look at the cultural identity of the individual. If we're going to, in a session, let's take an assessment session or an intake, the, the cultural formulation interview gives us a different perspective on that. Rather than just detailing marital status, age, income, insurance, and so on, these sorts of things are, should actually mostly be taken by a clerk outside of the session. But once you get into the session, there we can begin to talk about ethnic or cultural reference groups that this person belongs to because they have, as a result of those uh, links to culture, access to resources, strengths, and developmental challenges, con conflicts, and other predicaments. So we're going to look at that in the instrument as well. Uh, secondly, the cultural identity of the individual. Reaffirming the theme of this particular module, we're seeing that cultural identity of the individual is an empowering matter. However, it's not always the case. For instance, in the case of refugees, they find themselves, by virtue of their ethnicity or their culture, actually disenfranchised because they're perceived to be a threat. And those, those kinds of individuals can be at greater risk. But by and large, immigrants and racial and ethnic minorities, the kinds of involvement that they have with the culture of origin, uh, their home culture, and the culture that is where they now live, the host culture, that's a pretty important issue in how well they're going to function. Uh, we really don't have a lot of time to go into the sociology of ethnic relations, but the term acculturation is a useful one to understand in figuring out where a client or patient is in the trajectory that they have in their migration to the United States. We have people, obviously, in the United States who are Hispanic who have been here before the Anglos. For instance, I'm at the University of Texas at El Paso today. This was part of New Spain. It was also part of Mexico, and only more recently, actually within just 180 years has been, or less than that actually, has been a part of the United States of America. So we have people who are not just acculturated, but actually the dominant culture in the region. Then we have other uh, groups that come along later, and we see this process of acculturation taking periods of time, including up to a generation or two, to, to be fully manifest. But we need to identify with our client where they are on that acculturation scale. Um, not necessarily a scientific scale, but ask them how far they feel that they are identifying with their home culture as opposed to the host culture, their culture of origin as opposed to the culture that they find themselves in which while they may be in the majority, like they are here in El Paso, they're not, with, they're not primarily the power group. So that has importance for mental health because of the Hispanic paradox. The longer Hispanics are in the United States 
after having become a, after having immigrated to the United States, the more likely they are to get physically ill and to experience a mental disorder. That's very upsetting in the sense that we think that they're coming to a country that has a higher degree of wealth and a higher degree of so-called quality of health care. Paradoxically, the longer people are here, the less likely they are to be successful in measures of mental health and physical health. The Hispanic paradox then has, a, has important elements in their success. Notwithstanding, other elements are that their identification with their home culture, their or culture of origin, is a key protective factor. And as we saw, uh, or about to see in an upcoming uh, unit uh, from Dr. Felipe Castro, he points out that Hispanic culture is a major protective factor in immigrants, and that the more people are inclined to identify with their home culture, the stronger they are in resisting drug abuse and resisting um, dietary practices which lead to uh, poor health. <clears throat> The cultural conceptualizations of distress is an element of the uh, cultural formulation interview that's in important because when we understand the events that happen to an individual, to a client, distress is often what brings them into the session, whether it's distress over a loss, whether it's distress over intrusive thoughts, whether it's distress over anxiety, depression, what have you. These sorts of things are mediated in very important ways by the culture of the person that's experiencing them. So uh, apart from so-called cultural syndromes, um, we do see that people of Hispanic origin attribute different meanings to the way in which their, their experience is, is, is happening to them, the subjective experience of that, that, that distress, and the manifestation of that distress that they experience internally is manifested externally in very different ways than in a dominant culture. And we referred to the, the, the concept of somatization in which you tend to, rather than express your distress psychologically, I'm unhappy, to show overtly that you're tearful or excited or anxious to repress those sorts of expressions, particularly among male Hispanics, and to experience syndromes such as abdominal pain, uh, distress, uh, susto, uh, and, and other sort of culturally bound uh, syndromes. Uh, the co cultural conceptualizations of distress um, are also, uh, uh, can, can also be tied to an overall cultural assessment. Again, if you use a, a uh, strengths-based perspective, you're going to summarize the components of cultural formulation as identified in each of these sections so far, but by changing away from the notion that there's something wrong with the person, but that the person comes in experiencing distress, and how are we going to find within that cultural context the ways in which we can make them help, help them become successful. Now, very pivotal to this whole problem is the relationship that they have with the um, with the therapist or with the clinician. The clinician, especially if you're a clinician who looks like me, um, can be a bit off-putting to um, a recent immigrant or to a refugee or to a migrant, even though I would be able to engage that client in, in fully fluent Spanish. So one of the things that you begin to do is you try to build this relationship, one, not by trying to act like you're something that you're not, or, uh, but at least maybe not dressing like I'm giving a presentation uh, by the Hogg Foundation uh, for a class or for a group of therapists, uh, but actually looking like somebody who's on the street in casual uh, uh, business attire, um, who, who is open in his stance, who is able to, to form attentiveness and eye contact in a non-threatening way because I really have emphasized throughout this uh, whole module that you do not have to be Hispanic in order to be a good practitioner or clinician with Hispanic clients. But there are certain sorts of things that can very quickly deteriorate um, the, the relationship, the clinical relationship, and you find that people will shut down and uh, withdraw 
or obfuscate or obscure the meanings of what they're, what they're doing if you ask sensitive questions in an insensitive way. So by building that rapport, and as Dr. Chavez said in her presentation at the end, she said taking the time to build that relationship, to build that therapeutic relationship, is so much more important with this ethnic group than with others. <clears throat> now then, let's turn to the, uh, the cultural formulation interview. I think we've set aside some of the concepts about what, why we want to do culturally formulated interviewing, but here let's ask some of the questions that we're going to ask. Um, there are 16 questions that the APA recommends that you include in your assessment. And bear in mind that these are still in the trial phase, that you may access these on the website that we've provided, that you may use them in your clinical formulations, but we do recommend that you contact the APA, not because you're required for purposes of permission, but to be seen if these are evolving because this is an instrument that, that comes into play just in the last year and a half. <clears throat> in the cultural definition of the problem um, unit or, or section, you're going to ask three questions. Again, we're going to try in the cultural definition of the problem to understand the problem as they see it, not as I see it. Because I come as a trained person with a very different opinion and a sense of what's going on with a person who may or may not have a men mental disorder, an addiction, or be a victim of violence or oppression within a relationship. Obviously the question, what brings you here today? But therein, you're allowing, if you have rapport with them, to, for them to elucidate the cultural way in which they understand their problem. For instance, you follow up by saying, after you've heard something that sounds culturally significant, sometimes people have different ways of describing their problem to their family, friends, or others in their community. How would you describe your problems to them? I like this a lot because here you're asking the standard first question that you always ask in a clinical assessment. What brings you here today? You might, some variation on that might be, how may I help you? Um, the second question though, sometimes have people have different ways of explaining their problems to others and sometimes bad things happen to people in their lives. What, what would you tell um, them about what's happening to you today? Then they're able to jump out of, I'm not interested in what Dr. Lusk is thinking or what I have to say to him as this expert, this person who's culturally different from me. But I can, how, would, how would I express this to my compañera or to my madrina? And so then that then elicits that. And then the third element of the cultural definition of the problem, what troubles you the most about the problem? That's because culture mediates the significance to which uh, people attribute to, to an event. Um, let's, let's take, for instance, um, the, the notion of a violence within a personal relationship. All women, regardless of, of culture, uh, are going to find that to be a traumatic relationship because it, it devalues them as an individual, it, it is hurtful to them, it's damaging to the relationship, their children feel threatened by it, but how might that be mediated a little differently in, in a Hispanic female as opposed to a, to a white female? I'm not going to propose any generalizations that to be made on that, but when you ask them to, to, to the question, what troubles you the most about your problem, it gives them the opportunity to formulate what their re real, genuinely greatest concern is. My greatest concern is the safety of my children. My greatest concern is the way I'll look in the community if I report this. My greatest risk, and here's one I've seen a great deal in my practice, is my greatest risk is that if I report him, he's going to report me to immigration and I'm going to get deported. One of the threats that we've seen here in the border in particular. Then moving on to the cultural perceptions of cause, context, and support. You ask, why do you think this problem is happening to you? Why do you think this hap is happening to you? What do you think is the cause of your problem? This again gets at cultural meanings because what happens when people have um, a traumatic event or go through a period of sadness or grief is the meaning of that is so much 
are derived from their culture, not just their individual psychopathology. It has more to do with the way that they're coming up and understanding this culturally. So some people may explain their problem as the result of bad things that happen in their life, that's external locus of control. Others will say, this is something I brought on myself, internal locus of control. Or this may be the result of the way somebody looked at me in the market the other day, the malojo. Or it might be that I was startled and, and taken by unawares by something that happened to me that seemed so traumatic at the time, susto, all of these cultural, cultural manifestations that may manifest themselves as a mental disorder. So there we're, we're getting at the way in which they're understanding uh, the events that happened to them because I think the APA realizes that many who are therapists never even thought about this in the first place. How do you interpret this within your own context without saying culturally, how do you understand this? This is a way of getting to that question. The next question, is under stressors and supports. Are there any kinds of support that make your sadness, insert problem, better, such as the support from family, friends, or others? Because as I've said repeatedly, culture is a protective factor and a source of support, we're trying to identify specific areas of support. The traditional deficit interview, the traditional problem-oriented interview is saying, what's going wrong in your life? Have you missed work? Are you sleeping poorly? Oh, obviously we get to those sorts of questions. Actually, we often don't have to get to them at all. They come out in the course of the interview. But here we're shifting and saying, looking at the support system, because the stressors are the ones that we've been trained in identifying. But here, are there any kinds of support that you have, maybe from family, family, friends, or others. Conversely, are there any kinds of stresses that your depression makes worse, such as difficulties with money or family problems? And then those two might be mediated culturally. The role of cultural identity, we're going to ask questions eight, nine, and 10. For you, what are the most important aspects of your background or identity? I'll give you an example of why this might be important. Dr. Castro has pointed out that among adolescent Hispanic youth uh, who have an experience with substance abuse, those who are most resistant and have the greatest drug refusal skills are the ones who identify most strongly with Latino culture and the ones who identify more strong, most strongly with mainstream culture, such as is mediated or shown by television and so on, are much more at risk. So what are, the, for you, the most important aspects of your background or identity? Then they're able to say, these sorts of things are important to me, these sorts of rituals, these sorts of traditions are, or they might say, actually, for me, the most fun is going to the mall and hanging out with my friends, and then you see the material sorts of concerns. Question number nine, are there any aspects of your background or identity that make a difference to your problem? I think that explains itself uh, uh, and, and, is, and is pretty clear already. Are there any aspects uh, that are causing difficulties for you? Um, again, that comes somewhat out of the deficits model, but you're, what we're trying to do here, as you see in the left-hand column, is we're probing for migration-related problems, conflict across generations, or conflicts across gender roles. And then moving into the final few questions, these are the ones that affect cultural factors affecting self-coping and past help-seeking behavior. Uh, the first question there, number 11, sometimes people have various ways of dealing with problems like your problem, be it depression, what have you. What have you done on your own to cope with your problem? There we're looking at the self-coping skills that also uh, supplement the cultural coping skills that they bring to the question. <clears throat> the final um, questions are past help-seeking behavior. Uh, often people look for help from many different sources. This is question number 12, including different kinds of doctors, helpers, or healers. And in the past, what kinds of treatment, help, and advice have you sought for your problem? 
In the case of uh, Hispanic and Latino clients, we're probably going to see that most frequently they're looking to family and informal support networks, extended networks of friends, but also in many cases, especially for the more recently immigrated and less acculturated, we're going to see all kinds of other heaters and helpers from sobadores to curanderos uh, and, and so on. What kinds of treatment were helpful and not useful? Uh, I should go back uh, on this other and point out that if they are also use, utilizing the services of an herbalist or a curandera or curandera who's pre prescribing uh, non-medical um, traditional medicines to them, that needs to be identified in, uh, to the physician of record so that there, we're not getting any interaction effects between those herbs and other healing um, med medicaments that, that may confound the situation. And then what type of heat help or treatment was most useful and what type was no, not useful? That then you can use as a complementary or alternative medical approach. And then going back to barriers, has anything prevented you from getting the help that you need? And the probe here is, for example, money. Are they insured? Uh, work or family commitments? Are they in a threatening relationship? Or is there a stigma or discrimination associated with help-seeking behavior, which we have noted in this module is particularly acute among male, Hispanic, non-acculturated persons who see that accessing mental health services is a source of shame or a stigma. And then cultural, effect, uh, cultural factors affecting current help-seeking. Uh, we're getting into the last three questions. Now let's talk some more about the help you need. We're beginning to move to the intervention component of the assessment. What kinds of help do you think would be most, full, most useful to you at this time for your problem? Therein, we're asking them to become a full participant in the clinical intervention. What, would you, what do you think would be best for you at this particular point in time? And that, I think, turns again the patient helper relationship on its head because if they become a full participant they don't become a consumer or a recipient of your services they become an equal co-partner and are there other kinds of help that your family friends or other people have suggested would be helpful to you uh, now this is great because it spreads out the support network out of the isolation that a person with a, a psychiatric issue generally faces and that they seem to feel that they face this alone. Waking up at two o'clock in the morning with insomnia um, and fretting over the issue in cursive and intrusive thoughts, those happen when you're alone. Uh, but in and, and, and those situations, without these sorts of friends, family, and other people, they can come in to bear and say, how can they help you and how can, and how can, how can their suggestions be helpful in, in coming up with your intervention? And then finally, the clinical uh, relationship that you have with them as your client or your patient. Have you been concerned about this and is there anything that we can do to provide you with the care that you need? There you're beginning to move toward closure um, so that what can we do, we provide you with the care that you need. And then I would clearly focus uh, the conclusion of each session with a homework assignment saying now that we've talked about this, and here's what we've talked about. Recast the last 50 minutes of your session. Say we began with this. These are some of the things that you talked about. And we've come up with this sort of an action plan. I'd like you to do this over the following week. Read this particular handout that I gave you. Talk to your mom about this particular problem. Ask some other women in, the, in, in your friendship group who have experienced the same problem, what they think because if they don't take something away from the session, I think they'll come back sort of in having to put everything that you've talked about over the last 50 minutes on hold. In sum, the American Psychiatric Association, along with all of the other professional mental health organizations, is belatedly coming to grips with the fact that culture is a huge factor in the healing relationship that people have with the physician, the clinician, the social worker, and the psychologist. And more importantly, culture is the most important protective factor, I think, that we have in the arsenal of tools that we can bring to bear on their recovery. And only when we get out of the mindset that culture is a deficit 
and that being a new American, to be a minority American, uh, to be even a non-American person who's living here with a different culture, all of those things don't need to be seen as deficit. In fact, they're the tools to recovery, and on that I'll conclude.